All right, guys, we're back. Uh, we're working on our intake roller, drum roller project here. So last time we worked on the sheet metal structural components, we modeled the bearing blocks, and we started our main assembly here. So what we're going to do this time is we're going to start adding drive components. We're going to get some of that stuff, um, some components imported. We're going to do some more modeling. We'll get everything kind of in the model and constrained. We'll see how long that takes us and then uh, we'll go from there. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to go and get a half inch hex bearing CAD model, download it, import it, and constrain it in place. We're going to have four, so one on either side of these um, structural components. Now we've got four bearings on one shaft. In a lot of cases that's a lot. Typically you wouldn't want to have that many bearings on one shaft. Really you don't ever want more than two. Um, however in, in an application like this I, I typically prefer to have a bearing on either side of the um, structural component because of how long of a span there is in between these two. It just adds more support for the shaft and keeps the whole thing together as a unit um, under load. So. Uh, some other people might recommend something different, but this is what I usually do, and I've never had a problem with the bearings misaligning and causing binding or anything like that. So um, this is what we're going to do for this project. All right, so we're going to go to VexPro's website here. We're going to go to Motion. Actually, no, it's not under Motion. It's under Hardware, Bearings. Uh, this is the same CAD model that we downloaded for the gearbox output shaft bearing. It's going to be a flanged bearing. It's going to be a half inch hex. Actually, before I do this, do we already download this? No, we didn't. Okay. I just want to make sure we hadn't already downloaded it. Okay, so half inch hex, this guy right here. Download that. Make sure that in the folder. Cut that out of there. to Google Drive. I'm going to get rid of these. Those are the old step files that we already imported for this gearbox stuff. So, all right, hex bearing, going to go back to Inventor and open this up. Change this to all files. It's the files of type drop down. Select our step file, open wait a million years for it to import. Okay, click OK. Delete the sketch like we usually do. Set the material to steel. Set the appearance to semi-polished. Grab a work axis, place it down on a cylindrical surface. Also, that didn't change the appearance, so I have to go into solid bodies, go to the solid one, right click on it, click on properties, click clear all overrides, click this drop down box, scroll up to the top, click as part, click OK. Um, we talked about how to do this. I, I think we talked about this in the Gearbox project. You're going to have to do this a lot for imported components, so get used to, to doing that that short sequence of steps there um, because you're, you're going to, like I said, you're going to have to do it a lot. All right, give this a save, and I'm going to just close it out because we don't need it open anymore. We're going to place four of these in this component, rotate them in the right directions, constrain them in place real quick using insert constraints. So a uh, quick drag up with the mouse, click on our bearing model, click open. All right, so th we're going to just we're just going to start on the back, and we're just going to work our way this way. I, I th There's two ways you can do this, right? So I'm going to rotate this part. Uh, I want it to flip it the other way, so I'm going to rotate it two more times with the x-axis. So, obviously, the bearing here, like on, on this far side of this side here of this um, structural component, it's going to be turned this way. Then the bearing on the other side is going to be turned 180 degrees from that. And then this bearing here on the inside of this structural component here is going to be flipped the same way as this side. Now. I could place this bearing down and then place this bearing down because they're turned the same direction and that would save me mouse clicks of turning the component. However, I find if I've got 
a, an assembly that's got a lot of parts in it. I find it's easier if I place parts in a sequence that makes sense based on how they're where they're located in the assembly. So if I have to go back through the browser, I can see and I see like, for instance, we've got, um, you know, four of these bearing blocks all in a row, right? But I, I know based on the way that I placed them, that, you know, there's some sort of a logical sequence there. Um, so I, I, I try to, I typically, in a lot of cases, I try to minimize mouse clicks. However, in certain cases like this, I go ahead and I, I do the mouse clicks in order to put the assembly in a way that's more logic, more logical, I guess, to me. It, it's really based on per personal preference. And if you'd rather save the mouse clicks, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just choose to, to do it this way. So I'm going to end up doing extra rotations, but I'm going to place them starting at the outside and working my way this way. So this one then two rotations, I'm just doing the, I'm just doing the quick click and right drag up and to the left to rotate by the X axis. This one. So right rotate once or I can right drag like that. It's the same thing. So place there and then just two. So it, with that right drag thing, it really doesn't take long to rotate the part. So um, it really doesn't waste a lot of time. So, all right, uh, let's do the constraint tool here. Go to insert, default settings fine. I'm just gonna use this outer rim, I think is probably best. So there, press enter. This outer rim again, the edge of the bearing block, enter. And notice the direction the flange is facing. The flange is, is facing, you know, the right direction based on where I'm constraining it. Enter. And the last one. Okay, so that's pretty simple. So let's get out of this. Now we're going to go ahead and model the hex shaft that goes through here. So I'm going to press M to bring up the measure tool. Click on the outside face of this. And the outside face of that. 24 and three eighths. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna model a hex shaft that is 24 and three eighths inches long. So I'm gonna go up and click new, standard IPT and click create. Now, normally when I'm modeling, I'm like using keyboard shortcuts and stuff. For the sake of these videos, I'm really trying to click stuff on the screen because if I use keyboard shortcuts, you guys can't um, tell what I'm doing. Now, Sometimes I'm doing different things different times. So sometimes using keyboard shortcuts partially just for speed in the video and also just out of habit. I, I just forget and I, I do it. Um, but you're going to see me using different methods to do the same thing. Some of that's intentional and some of that's me trying to do it one way for the sake of the video and then forgetting and doing it the way I usually do it. Um, and some of it is also just that I want to show you guys a variety of different ways. Like when I'm constraining, sometimes I'll right click and hit place. Sometimes I'll do the right drag. Sometimes I'll go up here and click. And that's just because I want to kind of show you guys that there's multiple ways of doing each one and you just need to pick the one that you're most comfortable with. So a um, little bit scattered in terms of where my consistency, but some of it's intentional and some of it's accidental, but um, I'm aware of it, I guess. it's. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to just model hex shaft same way we always have. So click on the rectangle drop down and go all the way to the bottom and click, click polygon. The default is six sides, which is a hexagon, which is what we want. So we're going to do this now press escape to get out of that. Now by default, um, these will rotate. Gosh darn it. I hate the way it does this. So I'm going to press, I believe it's F nine. Yeah. You got to press F nine because it just shows the constraints. It's a weird glitch with these polygons but basically they rotate like this so you can rotate the hexagon which is not what we want so vertical constraint and just click on a side so now now it's constrained escape out of that now it's constrained so it can't turn so it can only change in size so dimension tool dimension the distance between the two it's going to be half inch hex like most of the stuff we use um, finish the sketch then we're going to extrude this out to be that 24 and 3 8 that we uh, measured earlier. I'm also going to change this to be symmetric so that it extrudes evenly on either side of the sketch rather than extruding all in one direction. This just helps a little bit with, with um, you know, it puts the origin right in the middle of the part, right, instead of all the way at one end. This is something pretty common that I do. So uh, click OK. Uh, we're going to set the material 
to the Autodesk Material Library. I don't know why it closes that. It's really annoying. It's going to be aluminum 7075. And I hate that texture. Aluminum flat, just like all aluminum parts in Inventor are. Okay, so then we want to center line through the center of this this shaft here. So we're going to do it the same way we did on the gearbox. We're just going to go to origin. We're going to turn on the Z-axis by expanding the origin box, right-clicking on Z-axis and checking visibility. Right-clicking and checking visibility. There we go. Um, the reason that this works is because in our sketch, we placed the center point of the hexagon on the origin and, and the, um, the Z-axis is, is kind of like coming towards the screen in this view, um, as you can see. Uh, so that just ensures that the Z-axis is actually at the center of the polygon. If we had put the polygon like over here or something, this would not work and we'd have to find a different way to define this uh, work axis. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. You don't have to use the Z-axis. Basically, you can just define axes using any of these methods. Um, a lot of them are going to require a, um, a point. So you're going to have to use a, you have to locate a point, then you're going to have to create the axis using the point. Uh, I'm not going to go into that here, but there's a number of different ways to do it. So uh, we're going to give this a save. Give it the next number in the sequence, which will be five. Press enter. All right, we're going to come back to this, but we're going to throw it in the, cons in the, in the assembly here. So place, oops place component, grab the shaft, click open, place it down, press escape, go to constrain, constrain the center line of the shaft to the center line of one of the bearings as you might expect and click apply. Um, then we just basically need to escape that for a second. We just need to basically line up. We made the shaft the same length is from the end of this bearing to the end of this bearing. So we just need to use a flush constraint to line the end of this up with the end of the bearing. And I'm going to explain we're, we're going to go back and we have to edit this shaft again and make or add add to it but i'll explain that here in a second so constraint tool uh change it to flush click on the end of the shaft click on the inner race of the bearing click apply now you'll notice the the hexes are not lined up um that's there's nothing wrong with that i, I talked about that in the gearbox project that we don't line the hexes up it really really is not important the bearing turns and the shaft turns. There's no reason to line them up. Um, it's just a waste of time, and it it adds a more processor load to Inventor when you're working in larger assemblies. So it's a good idea not to over constrain stuff like that. Um, now, uh, if you're doing a rendering or something, you're trying to get a nice rendering. You're probably going to want to uh, line these up just because you're going to get weird frame clipping and it's not going to look right in your render. So if you're doing a render, it's it's okay to go and constrain these or even just manually line them up like I was doing just by clicking and dragging. Yeah, that, that gets you close enough that you probably won't notice any uh, plane clipping in your render. But uh, for the sake of a mechanical design, there's no reason to line the hexes up. Okay, so um, now the question is, uh, how is this shaft going to keep from just sliding out one end or the other? And in its current state, it won't. However, we're going to do the same thing we did on the gearbox project. We're going to tap a quarter 20 hole, and then we'll put a washer and a quarter 20 screw in this end and the same in this end. And that will keep it from sliding out this way and this way. Now, keep in mind, once again, this, these structural components here are not representing a complete assembly. For an intake mechanism with a roller like this, Somewhere in the structure of this, you're going to need to have a cross member to tie the two sides of this intake mechanism apart. You can't keep them separate like this, otherwise um, they'll flex and they'll bend and, and just bad stuff will happen. So, so you're going to have to have some structural components to tie the two halves of your intake together. However, for this, that's outside the scope of this project. So for this project, we're just going to assume that these two um, structural units are properly mounted and properly rigid. So um, we can just put a screw on the outside of this and a screw on the outside <clears throat> of this bearing and we'll be okay. So let's go back and edit this. We're going to create a sketch on the end and place a center point. 
finish the sketch. We're starting the process of updating to Inventor 2019, so the whole dialog is changed in 2019 a bit, but it still works pretty much the same way, it just looks different. So if you guys are working with Inventor 2019 now, which I assume many of the CAD class participants are, um, but you're just gonna have to figure out the whole feature, um, which buttons correspond with what. It, it should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, and in my opinion, the new whole dialog is a lot better. So uh, we're gonna do a tapped hole and we're gonna wait for it to load as usual. I had to restart my computer because we lost our thumbnails in the last episode. Um, which I that's an that's an issue that crops up every once in a while. I've done a bunch of Google searches and basically it doesn't seem like there's any way to fix it other than restarting your computer, which does fix it consistently, it's just obnoxious. Alright, so a termination is gonna be a distance, and then the default is quarter twenty, which is what we want anyways, so just click OK. Then we're gonna go around the other side of the shaft. I'm gonna press S, which is the same thing as starting a sketch. So start a sketch there, place a center point down, finish the sketch, go to the whole feature, keeps our settings, quarter 20, tap to the full tap depth, and click OK. All right, so then um, I'm going to give that a save and close it because now we're done. Uh, just like most of our other projects that we've done, or the, I should say the two other projects we've done, we're going to save the fast, putting fasteners in for very last, so these will just stay a tapped hole. And we'll do our last video of us going through and adding all the fasteners. Except for rivets. We don't add rivets. That would be obnoxious. Okay. So we've got a shaft. Um, let's go ahead and add... Hmm. Let's, let's add our drum roller end caps. And then we're, let's get started with the gearbox and the belt and all that stuff. So give that a save. All right, I'm um, going to go, I lost all my tabs because I restarted, like I said, so we're going to go back to competition robot parts, which once again is my website. Uh, scroll down to the one and a quarter inch diameter roller end cap, click on that, and go down to where it says CAD download, click on the link, it'll download a zip file. It's a zip file because my web host does not like step files so it won't let me won't let me upload step files I have to do zip files or some other known file type like images or something so this is what I'm left with all right I'm gonna delete the zip folder I think I can delete that folder I might have to go back and do that again if I screwed that up but let's go in here and paste it yeah that's what I thought okay all right, I gotta redo that. So, CAD download, show in folder, right click, extract all. I leave this unchecked because it's annoying having Windows pop up. Extract all, go into the folder, right click, cut, go to my CAD class drum roller folder, paste it down. Now I'm gonna go back to my downloads folder and just get rid of these, holding control to select more than one and delete. Okay, going to Inventor. Open CRP R1 because I'm original at numbering things. Okay. Uh, delete the sketch. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So we're going to set the material. Material is 60, 61. I don't know, it's 6061. And it, for some reason, it sets the color to white. So I'm going to go to the solid bodies, right click, properties, clear all overrides, click on the drop down, scroll up, click to on as part, and then click OK. And we're back. OK. And a work axis, just like there. Now, you'll notice this looks very, very similar to the hex bearings. And actually, its outside dimensions are the same as the hex bearings. And those are, that was actually intentional. Um, I'm not going to go into exactly why that is, but um, it was intentional. And it's quite useful, actually. So um, we're going to use these. So close it out. We don't need it. Open. Uh, 
place component, grab the end cap. We're going to have one down here and one down here. So I'm going to rotate this twice and twice more. Once again, I wanted to place things right to left in this assembly as we're looking at it now. So I didn't place this one first. I chose to do the extra mouse clicks to, to place this one first just because I'm trying to place as many things as I can right to left so that it makes sense in this list over here. All right, constrain. Um, we're just gonna constrain the center lines to the shaft and then I'll talk about the rest. So this the big long center line, that's the center line of the shaft, that should be okay. So click apply and do the other one and click apply. Okay, so I'm gonna click and drag these in here. So basically this one is gonna be able to get pretty close to this end um, to the bearing. It can't actually touch the bearing, but it can get pretty close because we don't want it to rub. If it's touching the bearing, it'll rub the outer race, which is a problem. This side, however, can't go all the way. Um, yeah, it can't go all the way. Um, to onto the bearing, there's got to be a pretty significant gap for the pulley. So there's going to be a pulley here and then this. Um, and then basically there's going to be a piece of aluminum tubing that goes, that these two end caps actually press into the aluminum tubing. Um, we're doing this kind of backwards. Normally, normally you'd have a piece of aluminum tubing, you'd cut it to length, you'd press each of these in the end with a hex shaft as a guide, and then you would just slide the whole thing on your actual shaft. However, for the sake of the assembly, we know where the end caps are gonna go, but we don't know how long the tube is gonna be. So we're gonna model this with the end cap just kind of floating in here. Then we'll add the tube later once we know its exact length. So, so these two are gonna be tied together mechanically um, by the tube. It's just not in the assembly yet. So keep that in mind that these two are gonna be connected. So um, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a pulley down here uh, which I think we're actually going to go ahead and uh, import because it'll be easier to explain how this assembly works once we have a pulley in here to actually like visualize. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to give this a save real quick. Uh, next, we're going to go to Vex's website, go up to Motion, go down to Belts and Pulleys. Now, we had discussed last time which pulley we're going to use. We're going to use the 36 tooth pulley. So it's a GT2 timing pulley. We're going to go down to CAD files. We're going to find the 36 tooth pulley and click download. We talked about this in, in our first video where we we're talking about the layout sketches and all that stuff. So right click on the CAD model, show in folder, uh, cut it out of the folder and paste it into our project folder. Go back to inventor, click open, find the pulley, click open wait for inventor to do its thing Click okay delete the sketch okay so the material is if I remember correctly 6061 we're gonna add a work axis we just got to find a cylindrical surface this little boss works <clears throat> I'm okay with this color this color is about the color they actually are in real life so I'm not gonna bother overriding it we're going to give it a save. Um, all right, so now actually we can close that. All right, so now we're going to bring it in. We're going to place it in here and talk a little bit about how it's actually positioned. So that's fine. Press escape. All right, so if we go to top view here, okay, you'll see these little bosses stick out from either side. That's the hub. That's the hub that the hex bore is in the middle of. Basically, that hub is 0.7, and the inner race of the bearing is 0.76. So basically, 
the hub is the widest part, so we can just butt this pulley right up against the bearing, and it'll only be touching the inside part of the bearing, the part that's rotating. It won't be rubbing against the stationary part of the bearing. It's designed that way on purpose. That's exactly why it's designed this way. Um, so that makes putting this in here really easy. We just go to the constraint tool. We constrain the center lines of the pulley to the center line of the shaft. Click apply, and then we just mate. We just mate the end of the pulley hub to the end of the bearing and click apply. Okay, so some of the spacing in here we're going to adjust a little bit later. Um, I think to for now what we're going to do is we're just going to constrain because the pulley and this, this uh, end cap here are going to rotate together. I mean everything on the shaft is going to rotate all together. We're just going to butt this end cap right up against the pulley. So we're going to go to the constraint tool again. We're going to select the hub of the pulley and just click on the front face of the end cap. All right, so that keeps everything nice and tight. Ideally, you want your roller to be as wide as possible because the roller is going to be what's able to touch game pieces and pull them into the robot. So you want your, your roller to be as wide as possible so your grippy material can be as wide as possible. <clears throat> and then, excuse me. Your, um, your the width available for capturing game pieces is maximized. So you kind of want to squeeze everything as far out as you can. So ideally, we want as small of a space here as possible that prevents the end cap from touching the bearing. Now what we're going to be using here is we're going to be using a little spacer. We're going to be using those little black hex spacers from um, Vex Robotics. Uh, we used one of those Actually, we used a couple of those, I think, in the gearbox project. Now, the smallest, the thinnest one you can get is a sixteenth of an inch. However, we're not going to use a sixteenth of an inch one because of a couple of reasons. So there's going to be manufacturing tolerances involved with making this. So things are not going to be the exact size they're modeled in Inventor. And when you have a bunch of stuff on a shaft, you don't want them to be tight between bearings like this. So, so everything's sandwiched between these two bearings. You don't want them to be tight because that will put a bind on the bearings and it, it's going to cause your motor to have to do more work to turn the shaft. It's going to wear the bearings. It's going to damage the shaft. A lot of bad stuff happens if you start, if, if, things inside the intake are bigger than you expected them to be or the intake is not quite as wide as you expect them to be. So if 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 they're too loose though, so if, so like for instance, the biggest tolerance in here is this tube, right? The length of the tube. We, we got to cut that. Um, on Stellar Robotics, I think we usually just cut it with like a, a pipe cutter, like one of those ones that you you tighten the knob and they've got the little blade rollers that roll around. We, we usually cut our tubing with that and that's not a very precise method at all. I mean, we can get it within, you know, maybe 20 thousandths or something, but I mean, 20 thousandths, that's a huge tolerance um, when you're talking about machined components and stuff like we're working with here. So, so 20 thousandths is a lot. It's a big tolerance and it can be plus or it can be minus. Um, so uh, basically, if it's too small, that just means your roller can wiggle back and forth a little bit, which typically in an FRC application is not a problem. The robots aren't going to see enough use that that's going to cause any kind of a wear that you wouldn't expect. Um, however, if things are too tight, it's a problem. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is we're going to put an eighth inch spacer in here. And then if we were building this in real life, We'd put the eighth inch spacer in there, and then if things were too tight, we'd take the eighth inch spacer back out and replace it with a sixteenth inch spacer. And that would give us some extra space just in case um, things are too tight. If we start with the sixteenth inch spacer, the only thing we can do is take the spacer out entirely, which leaves this end cap to rub against the bearing, which is bad. So we're going to use a little bit larger space than we have to, but it, it'll give us some uh, protection against tolerance stack up. Uh, if we were to actually build this mechanism. So we're going to go ahead and constrain this um, with an eighth inch gap and we'll go ahead and add the spacer later when we add the fasteners. So go to the constraint tool, click on the front of the end cap, 
rotate around a little bit, click on the bearing and type in 0.125 for an eighth of an inch. Okay, so this is locked in place, it can't move. This is locked in place, it can't move. The pulley's locked in place, it can't move, except for spinning, of course, but we don't care about that. Um, let's give this a save. All right, so let's throw our gearbox in here and throw the pulley on the gearbox shaft and start looking at um, alignment for that. Okay, so yeah, so place component, going to grab our gearbox. This is the one that has the 775 Pro on it, which is what we want. Click open. We're going to rotate once by the Y axis because that's the direction the gearbox is going to be facing. We're going to place that down about there. All right. So the first thing that we know about this gearbox, we, we don't know a lot about the position of the gearbox. We got to find a good place for the gearbox. We don't know a lot about where it needs to be. We do know, however, that the shaft needs to be in line with the center line of this hole. Right, that's how this is designed. This is supposed to be a clearance for the shaft because the shaft is probably going to stick into this hole. Maybe we'll see. Okay, so um, let's go to constrain. Let's pick the work axis of the shaft. Zoom in and pick the center line of this hole and click apply. All right, that's that's great. Okay, now the motor can move in and out, or the gearbox can move in and out, and it can also rotate. I'm gonna control Z to undo that. We don't want it to be able to do either of those things. So rotation's easy. Let's let's solve that rotation problem real quick. So let's do constraint. Let's go to angular. Let's go to directed angle. Let's just pick the top of the gearbox and make it make it face the same direction as the top of this plate, and click apply. Now we could rotate this 45 degrees, and we could rotate it any angle we wanted, really. Um, but uh, square is really what we intended. If you guys remember our layout sketch, our layout sketch assumed it was square. If we rotate it, the corners are going to get closer to the roller and that might cause problems later. So square is how it was intended to be. <clears throat> if you want to turn it for some reason, I don't know why you would, but in some application you might need to turn it 45 degrees. If you're going to do that, you would want to represent it correctly in your layout sketch to make sure that the corner of the gearbox wouldn't hit the roller, which in our case it probably would. But anyways, that's constrained square. Okay, so now it can just move in and out. We will worry about constraining that bit here shortly. Um, but we know we know one thing. We know that there's going to be a pulley on the shaft of this motor. It's going to be this pulley, or the same pulley as this, right, on the shaft of the motor, and there's going to be a belt connecting to it. So let's let's um, bring a pulley in and let's throw it on the shaft of this gearbox here. I keep calling it a motor, but let's um, place component. Let's grab our pulley. Let's drop it in, press escape. I'm going to press the C key to go to constrain. I'm going to constrain the center line of the pulley to the center line of the gearbox and click apply. All right, so now we've got a pulley on the shaft. It can spin, it can move back and forth, and the gearbox can also move back and forth. Now, let's put the pulley over here. What's, what's the problem here? Well, we're going to have a belt on this. The belt can't sh turn a sharp corner and make it onto the pulley, right? So this, there's something fairly obvious that, that we know, and that's that these two pulleys have to be lined up. Now this pulley can't move, right? It's fully constrained. It's sandwiched between the roller and the bearing, which is where we want it. We want it off to the side, out of the way as much as possible. And that means that this pulley here needs to be lined up with this bearing. Or I'm sorry, this pulley here. I'm sorry, the two, the two pulleys need to be lined up with each other. Um, so let's constrain them that way. Now basically what we want to do is use a flush constraint between the two hubs. However, this um, end cap here is in the way. We, there's actually no way for us to get in here and select the end of this hub. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the end cap, go down to enabled and uncheck enabled. Now notice it becomes transparent. It's still there, but I can't click on it. I can't select it and its icon shows up green over here in the browser. I, I believe we did this in the Gearbox project, but I could be mistaken, which is the reason I'm going over it again. So now we can constrain these two uh, flush to each other, and then we can we can turn the end cap back on once we're, we're done with the pulley. So go to constrain, switch it to flush, click the end of the hub, click the end of the other hub. They should be lined up, so click apply. You can see that they are lined up. We're going to escape out of that. Now we can right click on 
the disabled part in the browser, go down to enabled and turn it back on. Okay, so now we have two pulleys that are lined up that they can spin, but that's okay. The gearbox can move in and out still. Um, however, that's not a problem for the moment. Let's give this a save real quick. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get. Um, I can decide exactly. I'm gonna have to break this video up into two parts because there's a lot going on. Um, I'm just gonna decide if I want to end it here or if I want to continue on and do more. We're gonna do we're gonna do one thing here and then we're gonna end it and then we're gonna have a second video. We're gonna continue pretty much right where we left off. Um, but we're gonna do one thing. So we're just gonna model a belt. The belt um, isn't really gonna serve much purpose in the CAD model, except for possibly weight. If you wanted to set the weight of the belt properly, we're just gonna kind of estimate the belt. We're not gonna, the belt's not gonna have any teeth. It's just gonna kind of run on the outside of the, the teeth of the pulley. It'll be like a millimeter thick. And it'll just kind of represent about where the belt's gonna be. That'll make it a little easier for us to look for interferences. And there's one particular interference I'm concerned about that I'm gonna talk about um, in the next video. All right, so let's model the belt. We know the center to center distance between these two in our layout sketch. So let's open our layout sketch and let's look at what that is. There's our layout sketch. 2.008 or 51 millimeters. All right, so let's just take some measurements here. If I go to the, press the M key to bring up the measure tool this surface here on the tip of the tooth in this CAD model specifically is actually an arc. This is actually a curved surface. The, the tips of all these teeth actually make a cylinder. Now I just know that because I've worked with these gearbox models before. Um, so basically what we want to know what the radius of the top of the teeth are. What's the, <clears throat> what's the circle that the top of these teeth occupy? So we can just pick this arc at the side of the tooth. That'll tell us that it is a 0.662 radius. And we're just going to make the belt a millimeter thick uh, because that's, you know, it'll look about right. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to go up and create new standard and click create. Now, this is, this is a rough, a very rough estimation of what the belt is actually going to to look like but it will serve its purpose in CAD it'll make it more visually appealing and it'll help us identify any interferences so we're gonna go to this is something I don't think we've used before we're gonna click the drop down um, under in the rectangle tool and we're gonna pick a center point slot now a slot is a shape that's actually referred to as an ob round which is basically uh, a a rectangle where the two ends of the rectangle are arcs. I really don't know the technical definition of the ob round, what exactly is an ob round and what's not an ob round, but a slot is an ob round. Anyways, uh, a belt in this particular case, the belt that goes around these pulleys is going to be that same shape. So this is this feature here is meant for creating slots for like bolt holes that need to slide back and forth, but it's really nice for modeling belts. So uh, I picked the center point one so that the center point of the, of the belt can be on the origin. So we click on that with the slot tool enabled. We click on the center point. We move out. We want to make sure we're horizontal. I'm not typing in any dimensions because that won't dimension it the way we want. I'm going to click, move my mouse out, and click again. And then we're going to go in back and dimension this. So I'm going to press escape. All right, so we know the radius. We know the radius was 0.662 inches. So I'm going to click dimension. I'm going to click this, which will give me a radius, and go 0.662. Okay, so the radius is right. Um, by default, the slot is constrained. When you place it in, the slot is constrained so that these two sides are parallel. You can see the parallel constraint there when I click on it. Um, so we don't need to dimension both of these arcs. We only need to dimension one. Now we just need to dimension the length, which is the center to center distance. Um, <clears throat> They give us a very handy um, 
work line here, uh, construction line here, which is connected to the two center points of these arcs. So if we wanted to mention the center to center distance of these two arcs, which represent the, the pulleys, uh, we could just dimension the length of this line. So click the dimension tool, click the line, place the dimension up top somewhere. We know the center to center distance is 51 millimeters and click OK. All right, so this is the this represents the inside of the belt, right? Because this is this is the same diameter as the tip of the teeth. So this will be the inside of the belt. We're going to use the offset tool to click on this, move out, type in one millimeter, and press enter. Okay, so now we've got we've got kind of a belt shape, and then basically what we're going to do is we're going to extrude this out. Finish sketch. The belt is nine millimeters wide, so we're going to extrude this out nine millimeters. So click the extrude tool, click the region at the outside, type in nine millimeters, and then we're going to actually split the difference. So we're going to do the symmetric um, direction. So it, it places it evenly on each side and click OK. All right, so um, we're going to just set the material to rubber, rubber, which makes it black. It's close enough. The belts weigh next to nothing, so I'm not super concerned about weight. And rubber is the closest material you're going to get. All right, so let's give this a save. Um, I usually name this um, GT2 three millimeter. I just try to name it something descriptive. I don't give it a part number because it's not a part that we're manufacturing. GT2 three millimeter. So it's it's a belt that is 70 teeth. Um, long, and it's 36 tooth to 36 tooth. That's just how I usually do these. Oh, it's three millimeter, G2 three millimeter by, oops, by nine millimeter wide. Typos, there we go. Um, that's good enough. It's That's descriptive of what it is enough. We've got a lot of belts in our Stellar folder, so I, I try to name them exactly what they are when I'm working on them, just so that somebody else knows what they are when they're working on it. Okay, so uh, let's see. We don't need the layout sketch anymore. It didn't change anything. I don't want to save it. I'm going to close the belt out. We're going to place the belt in here and constrain it. However, if we measure with the measure tool by pressing the M key, the length of one of these lines, we can see that no, we can't see. Uh, go to advanced settings, go to dual units, millimeters. All right, we can see that this is 10.668 millimeters long. It's a nine millimeter belt. So we need to be able to constrain the belt in the middle of this pulley. Now, it doesn't have to be in the middle. I mean, we could sh shove it over to one side if we wanted, but for um, the sake of what we're working on, I would like it to be in the middle because that'll look more natural. So what we need to do is we need a plane in the middle of this pulley to help us constrain this. So let's right click on this pulley and click open. And let's see if there is a, oops, that's all I wanted, origin. Let's see if there's a plane in the middle. And I cheated, I know, I know these pulleys, so I know there is a plane in the middle. So it's the XY plane. So just right click on the XY plane, turn on the visibility and give us a save. Um, we're going to turn these back off because they're ugly when they're in the assembly. We'll turn them back off once we put the belt in, which is why I'm leaving this file open. So um, actually, I closed the belt earlier, so I'm going to open the belt again because I want to do the same thing for the belt. So go to origin, should be the XY plane, right click visibility. This is the reason, this right here, what we're doing right here, this is the reason why I pick, when I'm doing the extrusion, why I pick symmetric. So if I need a plane that's in the middle of the part, I can just turn on an origin plane rather than making my own plane. So this is the reason why I do it. I advise you guys do it too, because if you need access to the center of something, it is a huge pain in the butt to create the work geometry to access the center of it. So um, that's there like that. So we're going to go into our main assembly here. We're going to click place. We're going to select our belt. We're going to open it. We're going to place it down, press escape. And then basically, we're going to constrain uh, this arc of the belt to this center line, this arc of the belt to the center line of the gearbox, 
and then we're going to just probably use a flush constraint to line up these planes with one of these two pulleys. So let's do constrain. Let's do this center line to the center line of the shaft. And click apply. Center line of the, well, let me show you. So right now the belt can rotate like this. We want to line up this center line with the gearbox. Click constrain that and we got to go in here and find the center line should be good yep click apply now occasionally if, if you got some weird dimensions somewhere you're not going to be able to constrain the two you're going to get an error when you do what I just did in some models in this model it should work but in some models if, if this is off by a thousandth of an inch or something you won't be able to do this and what you'll have to do is you'll have to turn on this plane and basically just mate this plane to this center line which will accomplish the same thing visually you won't be able to tell the difference but it'll it'll satisfy inventor um, and, and it'll stop it from giving you errors so that's just a word of advice I have to do that a lot in in certain models so yes okay so now we're just going to go back to the constraint tool place a flush constraint it could be a mate constraint because the, the belt is a mirror image so it doesn't really matter which direction this plane is facing in relation to this plane the flush constraint just feels nicer in this case so I'm gonna do a flush to there to there and click apply now that looks about right it's in the middle but we've got all these planes overlapping so we're gonna go back to the pulley uncheck visibility on the plane and collapse that and give it a save and close it and then the same thing with the belt turn oops turn off visibility on that plane and give it a save all right so we go back here okay we got a belt that's the right width the belt can move back and forth a little bit there's a little bit of slop on these pulleys and that's that's on purpose so there's not too much friction so we just got to keep that in mind we've also got to keep in mind that um there's teeth on the underside of this belt and i don't actually know how thick the belt is so the belt might might be thicker than this for all i know um, but it's a rough approximation and gives us an idea of what we're working with. So we're this gearbox can still move back and forth. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. There's, that's a kind of a more complicated issue, so we're going to save that for the next video. Uh, we're going to end it here. We will pick up where we left off in the next one. Thank you for watching.